Thank you, Shirshendu. So, yes, so we, yesterday we introduced the problem of inverse design with respect to time, a very simple problem uh, in the context of the broad theory of inverse uh, problem theory. But, uh, but as we have seen, that can be tricky already. We have seen first the difficulty that one encounters when treating these kind of topics in the parabolic setting or more generally for you know partial differential equation systems that involve some parabolic components for which you know the time reversibility is not guaranteed but so far we were always talking about models in which the backward uniqueness was guaranteed so typically though whenever one faces models that can generate singularities it may well happen that this backward uniqueness is lost and then new phenomena arise the most prototypical model for this is the classical Barger's equation we all know right so Barger's equation as a one-dimensional model for fluid dynamics became very popular in the 50s uh, because of the Hoff call transformation in particular that allows to get the solutions of the Barger's equation explicitly out of the vanishing viscosity limit, right? Adding viscosity, then using the Hoff call transform that allows to write explicitly the solution of the viscous Barger's equation in terms of the Gaussian heat kernel, like a ratio between two heat-like solutions, right? Uh, and then passing to the limit, right? So this can be found in many books, like in Witham's book, but of course also, for instance, in Evans. So we know that, you know, what the limit process leads to. And then the question that came out of this analysis was, this was a formal or, say, purely uh, an asymptotic limit, right? The question was, is the output of this limit the true solution of the Cochi problem, then people started investigating the existence and uniqueness of weak solutions for those models. Of course, there was already, you know, some arguments to be done in order to understand what a solution meant. For instance, bounded solutions will be those that fulfill the equation in the sense of distribution. This is not a problem because of the solution, if the solution is, is locally in L2, say, we can define the weak notion of solution in the sense of distribution if without any difficulty. We have the integrability of u and the integrability of u squared locally. That suffices to define local in time solutions. But then uh, because, uh, you know, in this half call transformation, they pointed out that in some specific cases, solutions could lead to shocks, to breaking waves, are those in these uh, pictures, right? they realized that further information was needed. In particular, when the solution is constituted by two smooth arcs, right? Being a weak solution in each piece is not sufficient. We need, you know, the so-called rankine ugonjot condition that determines the velocity of propagation of the shock, right? And then out of this, there was then the, the fundamental observations by Olejnik first, and then by Khrushchev, that one can, you know, achieve a good concept of unique entropy solution, right? So the, in particular, the proof by Khrushchev by doubling variables and then collapsing, you know, the the, the uniqueness, uh, the contraction principle, and so on, is uh, was pioneering at the time, and now it's a classical. So all in all, the Barger's equation, right, generates a very nice nonlinear semigroup forward in time, which, you know, for every initial datum, which is in L1, leads to a continuous in time function with values in L1. There is also a regularizing effect, somehow, or gain of integrability effect that makes that L1 initial data get into L infinity, and therefore in every LP, right? You also gain BV regularity in time, on the other hand, there is also a decay, t minus one half, 
for the semigroup generated by the Barger's equation, the same decay as the one-dimensional heat equation. So the three of them, the linear heat equation, the hyperbolic Barger's equation, and the viscous Barger's equation, they all share the same L1, L infinity decay with rate T minus one half. And the Barger's equation is also a contraction semigroup in L1, and it preserves also the mass. And it also fulfills the comparison principle. In particular, positive initial data lead to positive solution, and two initial data that are ordered will remain ordered, will lead to solutions that will remain ordered for all time. So these are, this is one of the most beautiful nonlinear semigroups that one can build, right? Of course, then the, the theory of nonlinear semigroups was, was further developed later by Crandall, Venilan, and so on. And we understand nowadays that the semigroup generated by, by Bargers can be approximated in different ways. One, as we mentioned before, was the Hofkoll one, adding viscosity and letting the viscosity go to, to zero in the purely continuous setting. But, you know, the theory of semigroup prefers rather to say, well, I replace the time continuous semigroup by an implicit Euler discretization in time. In this way, I view the continuous in time semigroup as a limit as delta t goes to zero of time discrete semigroups. And then each of these time discrete semigroups is just defined by solving the corresponding, say, a static problem. And it turns out that the static problem for the Barger's equation, because it's first order and because of the presence, possible presence of shocks, is not a standard. And therefore, even if you decide to do it through nonlinear semigroup theory, you have to work a little to understand well the existence and uniqueness of entropy solutions for this static model. And this is something you can do again by vanishing viscosity and then by a careful analysis of the uniqueness of the solutions you get in the limit, something that requires a proof a la Khrushchev again. So there are several paths, but we have a good understanding of the semigroup. As I said, one of the fundamental observations right, is that solutions of this problem, in case they are constituted by two arcs, u minus and u plus, to the left and to the right, the solutions have to fulfill the so-called Rankine and Ugonio conditions. So as you know, Rankine and Ugonio conditions, they were two French physicists that, you know, they like to understand, you know, the propagation of shocks and they were doing experiments, you know, using large tubes, right? And, you know, one of them was uh, producing an explosion in one end, and the other one was measuring, you know, the time that this, uh, you know, uh, blowing up wave will take to get to the other end. I don't know which of them was uh, doing uh, each of the two exercises, whether the explosion was generated by Rankine or by Ugoniot, right? And in this way, experimentally, they were able to see that, and this is what we write here in this second line, is that if phi t is the location of the shock, this shock propagates on time, right, with a velocity which is equal in this model to the average value of u plus and u minus, the value to the left and the value to the right of the solution. So this is why also on the beach, when we observe waves propagating, you know, when, you know, breaking and getting into the beach, we see that, you know, large waves propagate much faster towards the border, right? And this is due precisely to the Rankine Ugonio condition. Fantastic. Anyhow, I mean, this was a beautiful theory. I learned this, uh, you know, back, you know, 40 years ago when I was doing my master in, in Paris 6. And then in one semester with, uh, you know, Pierre Arnaud Raviar, we had the contents of the first book of Godleski Raviar, which uh, I think is delicious. And I recommend to everyone that wants to get introduced into this topic from a mathematical uh, rigorous perspective.
Okay, good. But now <clears throat> we are interested on backward resolution. Why? Because we are trying to solve an inverse problem in which, you know, someone comes, measures the solution at time capital T, right? This is what you see on your, you know, for instance, on the sonic boom problem, right? You are on Earth and you see this huge uh, sonic boom reaching to you and then you wonder who, you know, was which airplane, you know, what kind of airplane, which altitude, where, when, you know, this airplane produce this uh, sonic boom. So you want to, you know, find the one that is responsible at the origin of this uh, sonic boom that you are detecting on Earth, right? So in this case, here we are, we are at time capital T, we make a measurement, we observe a solution of Barger's, Maybe this solution of Barger's is not as smooth. It might have shock discontinuities, right, in particular, like in here. And then you wonder who at t equals zero is responsible. What is the initial datum for the Cochi problem, u zero, that is responsible for this solution? Of course, you want not only the location of the initial datum as a function, say, in L1 log or in L infinity log, but you also want to know what is the location of the shock. And needless to say, the structure of the solution might be much more complicated with possibly multi shocks emerging at t equals zero, interacting and then leading to a rather complex pattern that you want to unfold, right, backwards in time to discover what the initial datum was. Okay, this is the problem. And the first thing you observe is that, I'm sorry, in this case, there is no uniqueness. So this is the typical example. So we are here at time capital T, right? And we observe this solution of Barger's, right? So this is a very simple graph, piecewise linear, is zero to the left of this point. Then you have a rarefaction, a linear wave. Then you have, again, a flat piece. Then there is a shock going down, which is unmissable for Barger's, right? You know that for Barger's, shocks cannot go upward. This is why, you know, we have rarefactions, but we can have shocks downwards and then constant again. Okay, so you see two replicas of the same measurement done at time capital T. And we observe that this final measurement is compatible with, in particular, these two initial data. What is the initial data here? It's very simple. It's kind of a Riemann-like uh, superposition of two Riemann problems. So this is just the characteristic function of this set. Why? Because the characteristic function, this initial data on the characteristic function, when I solve now, I forget about backward resolution. We know how to solve the Barger's equation forward, right? So if I take this initial datum, I know this shock is inadmissible, non-admissible. Therefore, this shock will evolve into a rarefaction. Of course, the location of this, you know, top point, which has uh, height one, and therefore has to travel with velocity one, right? We will get to here. Right. While here on the initial datum, you have another shock going down. This time the shock is admissible and it leads to a shock. But according to Rankinu Gognot, we know that a shock of amplitude one has to propagate with velocity one half. And therefore, you know, the final location of this shock will be over there. So this is you know, this initial datum with two shocks, one inadmissible and the other one admissible, produces naturally by forward resolution this profile, right? But then once you realize that, you can also say, well, listen, but who knows? Maybe this shock here, maybe this shock here is not coming from a shock. Maybe initially I had a rarefaction for which you know that you know the uh, the the slope of this rarefaction as time evolves will get a steeper and a steeper and a steeper and maybe this rarefaction initially was so that 
right? The shock emerged precisely at the final time. So you see that this initial darun, in which I have kept the left side the same, so that this non-admissible shock generates this rarefaction here, right? Is superposed not now with an admissible shock, but rather with a rarefaction that fits perfectly this shock. Of course, you can find many other examples once you realize this, because I could have taken, for instance, uh, a steeper rarefaction so that it produces the shock earlier and then the shock propagates so I can merge these two, you know, examples. I could have taken here also like a star case shape, right, with some piecewise constant, right, rarefaction that generates this. So there are infinitely many solutions, right, initial data that will lead to this final profile, right? So then, as a mathematician, what do we say about this problem? We can say, well, the first statement is, listen, when you are looking to the inverse design, the inverse time resolution of burgers, there might be infinitely many initial data, right? Is this always the case? Well, not really, because you see, there are also for Barger's equation, there are very smooth solutions in which you can, you know, solve the Barger's equation just tracking characteristics without any crossing, any collusion. And then in this case, you can go backwards and, and, and forward, forward and backwards in a unique manner. So the question is therefore complicated, right? Because we observe that for Barger's, in some cases, you might have backward uniqueness, but in some others, you know, backward uniqueness can fail, and actually you might have infinitely many initial data that lead to the same target. Okay? So then what do we do? So this is like when you go to the doctor and you say, oh, you see, I have a red spot, right? Uh, and then the doctor says, well, you know, this red spot may have infinitely many uh, origins, maybe due to infinitely many, you know, sicknesses. It can be a mosquito bite, it can be a, a spider bite, it can be a, a snake bite, but it can be also be a dermatitis or it can be cancer. I mean, you have infinitely many possible origins for this red spot. Will you be satisfied as a patient if you go to the doctor with a symptom and the doctor tells you there are infinitely many possible sicknesses that are compatible with this red spot? No, no, no. You want the doctor to say this red spot is a, a snake bite, then you should take this remedy. So this is really a non-satisfactory answer. From a, an applied perspective, we need to know which is the origin of the measurement you are doing. But then as mathematicians, we have to say, this is something you will never know. There are infinitely many possibilities, and therefore, right, you will never be able to say. Something that is still not yet done, and it will be very interesting to determine, is to... Uh, adopt a probabilistic perspective and say, well, listen, there are infinitely many possible initial data that are compatible with, with this final solution, but I will give you the probability with which each of them could occur, right? So this is a, a very vague problem that I think is relevant and that will need some analysis and some uh, more precise formulation, because this is really the one that in applied sciences you will be aiming, right? I know there are several possible scenarios, but please tell me which is the probability of each of them. If you tell me there are infinitely many, but out of them there is one that arises with probability 99%, maybe this is the one that I will pick. Okay? So this is the context. So it's, it's rather complex, both from the analysis and also from the computational perspective. Because now, what do I do from a computational perspective? 
Should I look for all possible initial data? Should I be happy by having one, but you know, knowing that maybe I'm getting the wrong one? What should we do, right? So you see that this is a very simplistic drawing. This is what happens. We have many initial data, one, two, three, four, five, that lead by forward resolution along this horizontal axis from left to right, they lead to the same target, right? And this is done along a diagram as drawn here in which, you know, solutions can collapse anytime, right? As I have shown in the previous example, you can have two solutions that lead to the, to the same datum, you know, at the final time sharp, or you can have solutions that collapse earlier. And once they collapse, of course, they lead to the same target. So the tree that this infinitely many data can generate forward in time that collapses in the final target can be very, very complex. And therefore, when you try to solve the inverse problem, you encounter the very difficulty of explaining in some analytical, computational, or probabilistic manner how this tree can be reconstructed in the backward sense of time, right? In some more or less constructive manner, but knowing also that whenever you are adopting a path, right, you know, uh, the likeliness of this path might be higher or slower. So this is like, you know, many people getting into the metro station, right? This is a flow forward in time that we can observe how people get back to get into the metro station or even get into the wagon. What is harder to explain is when the wagon, the doors open, how these people will get out of the wagon and will spread. Okay? Very good. So what we do? We say, listen, uh, I will just do list squares. Computationally, as very often happens in in inverse problem theory, as I explained yesterday, basically what we can do is list the squares, right? There is plenty of theory, but computationally our, you know, tricks, tools are much more limited. So let me just do list the squares, right? And therefore I will try to say that given a measurement, D, this is the datum, I have measured a time capital T, I will try to find out the initial datum U0 that minimizes this functional. Of course, now I know that this minimizer is not unique. But in principle, right, when I give you a very complex model in fluid mechanics, which is mixed hyperbolic parabolic, and then I ask you, there will be one or many. Well, it will depend on whether solutions are regular forward in time or not. It will be very hard for you, given a complex fluid dynamics possibly multidimensional multi system of fluid dynamics to determine whether there is one or not, right? So you don't even know whether there is one or not. So the only thing you can expect is, listen, I will try to minimize this and see what I can get. If I get many minimizers, this means that there are many initial that are compatible with the final measurement. If there is only one that I find, this is maybe an indication that, you know, there is only one or maybe not. Or maybe you are just, you know, searching with a minimization algorithm that is always, you know, falling into the same well. Of course, computationally, as you know, uniqueness is very hard to prove. But this is the only tool we have. Let's explore this. Now, I minimize this functional for the solutions of the hyperbolic Barger's equation. But this is something I don't like. Why? Because the solutions of Bargers, as we have seen, they might have shocks. Therefore, they might be, you know, discontinuous. And therefore, uh, even the classical linearization of this integral, this functional, in which I will say, well, the linearization of this should be simply you know, this two goes away and this should lead to the integral of u x capital T minus u d times u dot, the linearization of u. 
this formula, the meaning of this formula is highly unclear because u is discontinuous and therefore the u dot should be continuous. So to have a good, you know, uh, distribution sense, but you know how u dot will be continuous if u itself is discontinuous. This will never match. So I want to avoid these difficulties related with uh, the differentiability of this functional. And this is why I say, okay, let's go back to Hofkohl. I know that the solutions of Barger's are the limit of the viscosity, vanishing viscosity process. So let me add some very small epsilon and do this. Okay? But now what happens? What happens then as soon as I add epsilon? I have made the problem parabolic. The problem being parabolic, that is backward uniqueness. So as soon as I add some epsilon, regardless how small it is, there is backward uniqueness for this problem. So given UD, I expect that when I minimize now this functional that I should denote J epsilon because there is an epsilon built in the state equation, there will be only one minimizer. And then I say, oh, that is fantastic. Right? Not only I have resolved the technical problem of guaranteeing the regularity of the solutions you I need to make this functional to be clearly Frechet differentiable, but furthermore, now I have gotten, you know, a way I have eliminated, annihilated the difficulty, the technical difficulty related to the lack of uniqueness. So is this good or bad? From a math perspective, it's very good, right? It's just now about minimizing this functional along a smooth dynamics with backward uniqueness. Fantastic. But from a practical perspective, maybe this is not what I need, right? I don't want a doctor that oversimplifies the scheme problem I have and simply tries to find an argument to justify that this has to be a mosquito bite. Because maybe it's not a mosquito bite. And I really want the doctor to tell me what it actually is. So you see that, you know, when we oversimplify the problem mathematically, making everything to go much more smoothly, we risk not to give a satisfactory answer from an applied perspective. Okay, very good. Okay, so we don't do that then. Okay, so I say, no, no, this is too brutal. I am too much oversimplifying the complexity of the problem. I don't like to do this. This will make a nice analysis paper, but it's not the solution to the problem. So what I'd rather do is, you know, I will replace this continuous functional by a discrete version. As you know, and we have, uh, I see the name of Silvan. I cannot see Silvan. He's probably there. Uh, or maybe online, I see uh, Silvan online, right? We have a, a small booklet with Silvan on the numerics for wave propagation control. And in that book, we explain, you know, how the discrete and the continuous approaches to the numerics of wave control can lead to two different scenarios, right? You have to choose whether you do discrete first and then you do control or whether you do control first or you do discrete. So here the problem is so complicated. Of course, whenever the problem is very complicated, it's always easier to discretize it first. Okay? We have to keep into account that when we do that, we are making a choice. And we have to a posteriori revisit what the conclusions are and whether and wonder whether we have missed something. Right? This is what we have seen here. I could simplify the problem by adding first viscosity, but then I am oversimplifying the model, the problem. I will get only one minimizer, while there might be infinitely many. So the same risk here, right? But okay, we don't know what to do, so let's do that. So I discretize the Barger's equation using a classical numerical scheme, as you know, numerical schemes, fully discrete, 
in a space and time with a uniform mesh. You can see all this in the book by Godleski and Radiar, you know, can be written in that way. I mean, and then the numerical, the different numerical schemes basically consist on choosing different fluxes, discrete fluxes G, which are all, of course, approximations of U squared, right? Because after all, Barger says UT is equal to minus DX U squared over two. So this has to be an approximation. The G here has to be an approximation of U squared over two, right? Why? Because then U squared over two minus U squared over two divided by delta X, right? Leads to an approximation of the X derivative of U squared over two. And I see on the other hand, putting this on the left and divided by delta T, I see here the UT. So most numerical schemes that we like <clears throat> can be written in this conservative manner, right? This will be a conservative scheme if you add with respect to the index J, right? These fluxes will cancel each other and then you will have that the sum of with respect to J on the left is equal to the sum with respect to J on the right. And this means, so there is a swapping here on the indexes, sorry. N should be on the top and J down, right? And this tells you that this numerical scheme is preserving mass, right, a long time. Of course, this is something that is very important, right? So everyone doing the same happens nowadays in, in the context of machine learning, modeling through data and so on. People want to guarantee that the numerical schemes or the new deep neural network they are generating for mimicking dynamics are structure preserving. And in this case, one of the features we require to the numerical scheme is please preserve the mass. But as explained in the book with uh, Sylvain, we also say warning is not because you preserve the Hamiltonian structure of the wave equation through your numerical scheme that the numerical controls will converge to the continuous control. So it's good to be structure preserving, but please keep in mind that this is not sufficient. The reason being, in particular, in the context of wave propagation, and this fully applies here, that structure preserving, right, means that you are dealing with a process in which waves propagate, but it does not necessarily guarantee that numerical waves have the correct velocity of propagation. And this can be, of course, a nightmare when you are dealing with control or inverse problems, okay? Anyhow, we know all this, but despite of this, we don't know what to do. So I discretize this functional, I discretize the Barger's equation, and I see what happens, okay? So this is the uh, an experiment, <coughs> again, done, <coughs> sorry, by Alejandro Pozo, former PhD student in our team. As yesterday, you can identify the style of the experiment. So the experiment is similar, right? We have a target. The target is UD. This is the measurement we have done. So I go today to the field, and I have observed this kind of sonic boom, right? This N wave in blue is the one I have measured. And then I wonder, oh, what will be in green the initial datum that this, you know, through forward Barger's resolution is compatible with this blue measurement, okay? So then, you know, we initialize the process with the initial datum zero. For initial datum burgers zero, of course, the solution ut is zero, and this is in red. And now, by minimizing this functional, now discretize, right? Using the flux function of Enquist Osher, EO, Enquist Osher. So this is the numerical discretization of burgers in long time, time equal 2,000, right? So why not, right? In the Big Bang is uh, 14,000 million years. So time can be long, right? Uh, a supersonic aircraft can fly 20 kilometers high. So time for reaching Earth can be long for the sonic boom, right? So time can be long or short, but let's see what happens for a long time. 
because this is more challenging. Of course, computationally, analytically, it doesn't really matter, right? But computationally, of course, it's much harder to guarantee an accurate backward resolution in, in long time. Okay, so this is why we make it challenging. And then here I say, okay, this is the starting point, right? Because when u0 is zero, the solution is zero, and there is a huge gap with respect to the target. But then, you know, as uh, I iterate through gradient descent, right? These are the number of iterations up to 300. I expect the functional to go down and down and down. And then I expect that the green line, right? of u0 will emerge, you know, will lead to an initial profile so that the red line becomes, you know, nearly the blue one. Okay, so let's see what happens. So we see the green initial datum emerging and in red, the corresponding solution of the Barger's equation according to Enguist structure. On the right, we see the functional going down, down, rather steep. So here we see that we are getting very close, right? Of course, then things are getting tighter because we are really getting close to the minimum. And then that's it. So basically, we can say that in this case, doing numerics, doing least square on the numerical algorithm corresponding to enquist tosher has led to a satisfactory solution of the problem, right? So according to this numerical experiment, the initial datum is this kind of N wave. So it's basically zero, then linear down, then linear up, then linear down, and then zero again. And then indeed, if you check how the solution of these problems looks, you will see that this is fully compatible with our understanding of what the forward resolution of Berger's is, right? Because this is a, you know, a line that is going down. It has the tendency to generate a shock. And this is what you see here is a quasi shock here, right? Is the, this segment going down is the, output of this initial segment here in the green line, then this uh, segment going up has to lead to a rarefaction. And this is what you see here, right? This growing slope. And again, this line going down, you know, by Barger's uh, forward resolution, it has to propagate. Of course, everything propagates to the right, right? So here, right? The positive parts of Barger's propagate to the right. And therefore, this slope is getting steeper and steeper until you get here. Of course, the negative part here goes to the left, right? But this is due to the fact that the Barger's equation, if you expand it, you can write it down as ut plus u, ux equals zero. It means that everybody propagates with velocity u. It means that negative, you know, initial data propagate to the left, positive, right? Initial data propagate to the right. So this is like a, a segregation model in which negatives go to the left. We don't want them. They go to the left. And then people that are optimistic and positive go to the right and we stay with them. Okay? So this is what we see. It's fantastic. It's well done. So are we successful? Can we say that we have completely solved the problem by using this discrete approach and least square? or something is missing what do you think any comment well i don't think we can be completely satisfied because we anticipated that there should be infinitely many solutions and of course i could produce here changes where you know instead of having this line i have put here maybe a flat region and then a another line there are many many other green lines that are compatible with this blue one. But this procedure will never give any other one than this green one. So you see that somehow, whenever we are doing numerics, we are restoring the uniqueness of the initial datum. But why is that? Well, this is well known in numerical analysis for 
conservation laws, right? Actually, you know, the way the proof of the convergence of, in particular, this Enquist torture, but many others, uh, Las Fredes and so on, schemes for scalar conservation laws goes, is mimicking what the vanishing viscosity does. So if the numerical scheme converges, is because, well, yes, it's a structure preserving on one hand because you conserve the L1 norm, but it's entropic as well. It generates a contraction in L1. It generates uh, BD estimates. It's adding numerical viscosity. So actually, you know, a, num a convergence numerical approximation for a hyperbolic conservation law typically is simply mimicking at a numerical level, what the vanishing viscosity does. So it's a structure preserving, but only to some extent. Why? Because, you know, there is no viscosity in principle in burgers, but there is always viscosity numerical. So this being a structure preserving, as I said before, is a bit superficial concept that we have to be careful about. In any case, the numerical scheme here converges because it's stable and consistent according to Lack's general principle, but the stability of the numerical scheme obliges to use viscosity. And because of this numerical viscosity, we are mimicking the same scenario as we will encounter if we will have solved this problem analytically using half core. You get the only one solution that the system prefers. So you see that somehow the numerical solution that is emerging here is the most likely one, right? So think on this probabilistic perspective to the problem I formulated above before, right? Do you already see that uh, this occurs in the sense that we can say that among all the possible solutions that are compatible with this blue final profile, the green one here is the more likely one, the most likely one. Why? Because most numerical schemes will lead to that one. And why most numerical schemes will lead to that one? Well, because numerical schemes to be convergent, they have to be stable. And to be stable, they have to add viscosity. And because they add viscosity, they are doing basically the same as half core. So there is at least one argument to say that this is the most likely one. In fact, it will be hard to compute any other one. Actually, you know, if you ask me, and this is the most difficult part here, maybe, if you ask me, please develop numerical schemes that will give me these other solutions that are possible, this will be very hard. But this is typical in numerical analysis, right? Do you, you, you recall, for instance, this... Uh, Serin's uh, counter example, right? So you know that, you know, uh, the Serin counter example says there is an L infinity positive coefficient A of X, so that the equation minus divergence of A of, of X gradient U equals zero with zero boundary data has a non trivial solution. And people wonder how can it be? Last milligram says that for an elliptic problem with say, uh, measurable and bounded coefficients, non-negative coefficients, there can be only a, a unique solution when the right-hand side is equal to zero, is the zero one. And then Serrin finds a different solution. Well, yes, but Serrin's solution is not in H10 of omega, right? This is a purely explicit computation using radial coordinates that you all know. So Serrin's solution is a way, is beyond the space H10 omega. So we have to be careful because Lutz Migram says what it says. It says that there is a unique solution in H10 omega that fulfills the equation in the sense, in the weak sense. But Lutz Migram doesn't say that there is not another solution away from that space. And this is what happens. Now, whenever you do numerical approximation, you will never get this certain solution. Why? Because if you do Galerkin, you do uh, finite differences, you do finite elements, you use some spectral approximation, of course, you will always get the smooth solution. You will get the zero one. 
So in order to be able to compute this singular solution, right, you have to know that it exists and you have to somehow put on your Galerkin basis an element that is able to generate this singularity. This is what is called X fen, where X means that in this X you have added the singularities that through asymptotic analysis you have computed for your PDE. Otherwise, the numerical algorithm will never find them. This is why it's so difficult to say anything about Navier stocks numerically. Because, you know, only the day we know whether Navier stocks, you know, has singularities and we know how these singularities are, then yes, people will be able to develop codes in which you put this singularity somehow embedded in a more or less intelligent manner, and then the singularity will emerge. But while we don't know, it will be very hard to say, uh, you know, how singular the solutions are out of numerics. This is why I, I admire these people in Big Bang Theory that are able to determine that the Big Bang occurred 14,000 millions ago. They are certainly, you know, much stronger than we are, right? Good. Let's do the same exercise now. You say, well, Enquist torture is, of course, a, a well-known numerical scheme for doing this. But before Enquist torture, there was Lax Friedrich. It was maybe the simplest conservative numerical scheme for burgers. Let's do the same exercise. I, of course, expect the same solution, right? Because again, Las Fredis converges because it's a stable numerical algorithm and it's stable because it's viscous. So I expect the same green line emerging. So same experiment, time equal 2000. I take the same target in blue. I start from the initial datum, which is zero, so that the solution in red is zero. And then by minimizing the discrete functional, the only difference of this discrete functional with the previous one is that the U now is computed through Lax Friedrich and not through Enquist Tosher, is uh, the numerical scheme. And then I expect the numerical, you know, the functional, the discrete functional will go down. And while going down along these 300 iterations, the green line will become the N wave I have seen before. Okay, let's do the numerical simulation. And I see indeed the same tendency. Okay. The functional is going down on the right. The, the red line is getting closer to the blue line. It seems on the right that the functional saturated much earlier. The functional on the right exhibits more difficulties to reach the target and because of that you see that even though the profile here is qualitatively similar to the one before you see two differences you see many more oscillations here right many more oscillations here and a bigger amplitude over there so it seems that the functional has difficulties to go down. So you see also the gap between the red line and the blue line is bigger here. And therefore, because the functional has difficulties to go down, you know, the minimization process is putting more and more emphasis on the initial data and is trying to compensate the difficulty to match the target with higher amplitudes and more oscillations. So it's a phenomena very similar to the one we experience with the instabilities of the backward resolution of the heat equation. And then you tell me why, why the heat equation? We are dealing here with burgers. Yes, but recall that in the last Friedrich scheme for burgers, there is viscosity, numerical viscosity built in. So the heat equation is higher than there. And it seems, according to our numerical experiments, that there is more viscosity in Lax Friedrich than in Enquist Tosher. Having more viscosity is fantastic for forward resolution, but then is a dramatic for backward resolution. And of course, this is also why Enquist Tosher developed the numerical scheme, because they observed that Lax Friedrich was indeed convergent according to the classical consistency and stability criteria but it was too viscous, so it was smearing the shocks out, 
and it was not good enough in order to have an accurate picture of the solution in future times. This is what we see now, but in a backward sense. And then you can compare them both, and then you see it. Right? So this is the Enquist torsion on the left, Lars Friedrich on the right. You see how you know the functional goes much nicer down to zero in Enquist torsion that in Lars Friedrich that saturates very early, and uh, the byproduct of this is that you know the matching of the red and the blue line in Enquist torsion is better than in Lars Friedrich, but not only this, right? While the initial datum for Enquist torsion is this. The initial datum you get through Lars Friedrich is this. Okay, so now the question comes, and this is a fundamental question. You might say, well, Enrique, you said from the very beginning that there are infinitely many initial data that are compatible with the final target. So maybe actually what Enquist Tosher and Lars Friedrich are doing is getting two different initial data that are compatible with the final target. So we have to really determine whether this is true or not, right? So when two people get, you know, two different answers through two different numerical experiments, then it is compulsory to try to understand, are there two different solutions? So this justifies that these two guys are getting two different solutions, or there is only one solution, and one of the guys is doing a correct experiment while the other one is doing it wrong. What is the scenario? Okay, so let's check. How do we check? Well, we do the following. This was done by Navid Alaverdi, that was a postdoc in our team, right? Um, who is now in, in, in New York, right? So he's a professor in New York City in computational free dynamics and, and this kind of inversion problems. So, Navid said the following, okay, so let's make things even more optimal from an optimization perspective. So, instead of using our own gradient descent algorithm in MATLAB and so on, he used the so-called IP opt algorithm, right? Interior penalty optimization, as you know, it was developed in particular in Pittsburgh, in Carnegie Mellon by the community of, uh, you know, uh, chemical engineering for solving large optimization problems. It gives uh, extremely, you know, accurate results for nonlinear optimization problems. So what Navid said was, okay, let me, you know, to make sure that we are really getting to the optimum in each case, let me just uh, use, discretize the PDE, discretize the functional and use IPO. I don't want to be trapped by your naive perspective of solving the minimization problem using gradient descent. Let me let IPO do it better for you. Okay? And this is what he did. Right? Okay? So he did solve the problem using he did solve the problem using Lars Friedrich, right? For this blue target, and he got this initial datum. Right, so he asks IP opt, take burgers, discretize using Lars Friedrichs, discretize the functional, and give me the initial datum in green by IP opt, and he got this very oscillatory solution. Strange, we got this very oscillatory solution by IP opt. So let's first check that this solution of, for the initial datum in green is correct. How do you do it? Well, you solve last three of these backwards, and you see that the green line eventually matches the blue. So everything is perfect. So it will replace Barger's by Lars Friedrich, and you ask the answer to IPOP, a fantastic optimizer, you get this green right line. But now, okay, take the same green line and now solve the equation backwards with Enquist torsion. Why? Because Enquist torsion, we know, is able to track the dynamics of burgers forward much more accurately. 
So if I really want to test whether the Lax Friedrich numerical initial datum obtained through Lax Friedrich is correct for you know for the Barger's equation truly, I should not use I should not solve the last phrase scheme, but rather enquist torsion, which is much more sharp. And then let's do it. If I do that, let me show if I can find the cursor. Yeah, the cursor is here now. Okay. Sorry. If I do it now with enquist torsion, Sorry, how difficult it to find the course. What is, how can I get rid of this? Okay, bar. Okay, here it goes. It evolves, right? The initial datum for Lars Friedrich now in red is evolving towards the final target. It's good, it's good. We are really collocating the solution at the final location properly. Good. So time is running from zero to 2000. This is why it's taking long, right? And then we get more or less what we wanted. But you see that basically there are errors that are totally artificial, right? So then we can say that, you know, this initial datum generated by the minimization of Lars Friedrich optimally by IPO is not so bad, but is certainly not a good solution. Why? Because there are many oscillations that are not realistic. So here we can claim, no, we didn't get to a minimizer. We got to something that is not far from a minimizer, but is actually contaminated, is polluted, by many numerical high frequency components that do not really belong to the true picture. So you see, and this is precisely the motto of our book with Sylvain for the linear wave equation where everything can be done much more explicitly in some sense, is that be careful, right? If you apply the discrete approach for control or inverse problems in wave propagation theory, even if you do everything properly, like use a numerical scheme like Lars Friedrich, which is consistent, stable, and convergent, which is structural preserving and blah, blah, blah. And you use it to, you know, even you use a very good solver for minimizing the problem, you might get to the wrong solution. Okay? So we will continue with more analysis on this tomorrow to better explain what's going on on this, say, uh, apparent numerical, say, uh, trap. Thank you, Professor Juazua, for the nice talk. <laughs> Professor Juazua, in online there is a question. How is the guarantee that the oscillation in IPOPT of the initial data does not lead to shock? I didn't, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, how is guaranteed the oscillation in IPOPT of the initial data does not lead to shock? Well, I cannot guarantee anything, right? So this is pure uh, computational experiment. So think uh, to begin with, I didn't say, but it's uh, of course uh, very relevant. We are dealing with non-convex problems, right? So this problem, minimization problem here, of course, I, I should have said that much before, right? Uh, this problem here is non-convex. There is a square there, very nice, but the dependence of the solution on the initial datum is non-linear, and therefore the convexity of the functional is lost. Actually, we know the problem might be non-convex, in particular because we know for some initial data, sorry, for some measurements, final data, we have shown that there might be infinitely many initial data compatible, so which means that there are infinitely many initial data for which the gap between ut and ut is zero. And in that case, whenever the initial data leads to zero on the value, you are on the, on the complete minimum. So it means there are situations where there are infinitely many minima. 
So it's not that we don't know how to prove convexity, it's that we know this is not a convex problem. So when we do numerics, we, of course, the functional J is uh, translated into a JH functional, but you don't expect by small numerical errors to avoid the, the presence of, you know, lack of convexity. What happens basically in this problem is the following, you know, we have many, infinitely many minima, all at the same level, leading to the value zero of J. When you introduce the numerics, you are, you know, twisting, you are correcting a little bit the graph of J. And what seems to happen is that, of course, you will keep these infinitely many wells. Right? The wells will not disappear because you introduce an H approximation, right? There will be all these infinitely many wells. But there is only one that is really at the zero level. All of them, all the others will be lifted. And this is why the numerical algorithm consistently <clears throat> gets to the same kind of minimizer. Are they the same according to the different numerical algorithms? No, they are not the same. This is milder and this is, you know, there is more contrast, more oscillations in this one. But now, as I said before, if you ask me, how do I know that these oscillations do not lead to shocks? Well, I actually don't know. What I have done is a numerical, you know, resolution out of this initial datum with Enquist torture. And what I see is that there is something wrong on this initial datum because these oscillations stay, they don't disappear, and they are not compatible with the final target that was measured. Any other questions? Hello? Yeah, so the uh, Lax Friedrichs are getting oscillations at the kinks, right? Which means if you resolve the kinks properly, shouldn't you get rid of the oscillations? Sorry, can you say again? In the lax Friedrichs, the oscillations yeah. are happening at the kinks, right, in the end. So if you resolve the parts where you're kinking uh, even more, then can't you get rid of the oscillations? Well, sorry, I don't understand you. Okay, so I think what I said is uh, quite clear, right? So you can solve the inverse design problem numerically using two numerical schemes, right? Of course, each time you do it, you are solving properly the numerical optimization problem. In both cases, you have solved it properly. And this is why when you say, listen, I got this strange object, I solve it forward according to Lars Friedrich, then you see that, of course, it fits, right? But still, still, this is not sufficient for an expert. Because an expert will tell you, listen, before I buy this, before I buy this very oscillatory green solution, I want to make sure, because I have read the book by Silvana and Enrique, before I buy this green oscillatory solution, I want to check better whether these oscillations are really physical or not. So how, what is the ideal way of testing whether these green oscillations are physical or purely numerical and spurious? Well, the best way will be to put this green oscillatory initial datum in an exact formula for the Barker's equation and see what happens. Well, instead of taking the exact formula for the Barker's equation, this is something you can do. This is a good exercise. Just do it if you want. We have done it computationally. And what we have said is, listen, I know there is a dynamics that is closer to Barger's than Lat Friedrich, is enquist -Tosher. So I plug this initial data in enquist and I check what happens. And then I can say there is something wrong in the solution you got by Lax Friedrich. It's not that bad. Maybe it's 90% good. But there is still 10% of oscillations that are totally spurious. And they are due to your numerical algorithm. Yeah, so since it's due to the numerical algorithm and the spurious oscillations are happening at the kinks, right? So if you resolve that better in, during your algorithm for lax Friedrichs, 
uh, you could get rid of it, right? Well, of course, you can always get rid of, uh, yeah, you can get rid of them just using Enquistosho, right? So that's the moral, yeah, I mean, you can post-process, of course, right? You can post-process, you, you, what you said is totally right, and this will be also very interesting to do, right? So you take Enquisto, uh, sorry, you take uh, burgers, you do any kind of numerical algorithm you are used to, you do inverse backward design by optimization at the discrete level, and then because you have realized this, you do some post-processing. Yeah, there is, yeah, there is post-processing numerical analysis uh, that you can do, but you have to do it. Well, this is just a warning that you should not accept the numerical solutions just as they come, right? Some, you know, something may happen, and as you properly say, you either change the numerical algorithm, so I will recommend you do Enquist Osher, or as you said, if you observe unwanted oscillations, right, do post-processing. But this is the message, right? You need to do something more. You cannot simply rely on a numerical discretization and numerical optimization and, and accept the solution as it comes. Because if you put it into the real model, right, this will not work. So nowadays everyone talks about digital twins and so on. You could say this. You could say, well, listen, if you say that Lars Friedrich is a good digital twin of burgers, I tell you no. Why? Because some very basic inverse problems like backward resolution are not properly done. If you tell me that, you know, you took Enquist Tosher as a digital twin of you know, the dynamics, the fluid dynamics generated by burgers, I tell you this is much better. Because Enquist Tosher at least, right, resist the stress tense, uh, the, st the, the stress uh, test of backward resolution for burgers. Thank you, Professor Jiva Jiva. Thanks to you. So when you have this, you told that when you introduce this epsilon corresponding to the cost functional J epsilon, it will have a minima, it will have a minima, unique minima corresponding to that one, right? Corresponding to adding the viscosity that let's say that is U naught epsilon. Now, if you, if, if your epsilon tending to zero, this U naught epsilon, will it converge to the lower, the, there are be backward construction for the in, in viscous case, lot of U naught. Will it converge to the norm of U naught, minimum norm of U naught? I don't know. So certainly there is gamma convergence. This is uh, out of doubt. Now, which of the solutions uh, which are compatible with hyperbolic burgers you will get, which is clear, is you will get to this, right? You will get somehow, in this context, you will get to this one. Somehow the one that is more smooth. This is the answer. So when you do viscous burgers, you optimize the process and then you let epsilon go to zero or you do it through, you know, enquist numerically and you let delta x go to zero, you will get this, which is somehow the more smooth initial data, which is compatible with this final profile. So somehow in this path here, right, this is the path you have taken. There is a unique backward solution, right? Which is entropic. You see, actually, so this is very interesting and is related to the discussions we'll have next uh, in the next two lectures, right? Look to this equation. Well, when I watch this equation naively, I say, well, this is just a, P what is a PDE? What is the definition of PDE? Well, it's just an algebra differential, uh, you know, restriction on on functions, right? So a PDE for functions depending on x and t is just an algebra differential restriction on u. When I look to this algebra, this object, simply as a PDE, a differential operator applied to u 
through, if you want, to U square to make it mildly nonlinear. This is what semi-linear, right? According to the classical terminology, is not even quasi-linear, right? When I look to this, I don't see any time irreversibility on the on there. I mean, the formula here is fully timely re reversible. I can change t into minus t and x into minus x, and the formula remains the same. So we learn about time irreversibility in burgers when we discover, and this is something that is you know written in the in the in the very first chapter about you know weak solutions for burgers, is that being a weak solution in the sense of Rankin Ugonyot is not enough for uniqueness. Why? Because whenever there is an inadmissible shock, there is a weak solution which is not entropic that instead of you know regularizing this shock into an end and uh, an um, rarefaction will generate a propagating inadmissible shock this is a weak solution according to rankinu gonyot but is not the entropic solution so so we are here dealing with a problem in which you see shirsendu there are infinitely many weak solutions for this problem so now when you say, okay, but I'm dealing with the Cochi problem forward in time, and I define the notion of entropy solution forward in time, right? You get one evolution. And when you define, and you can always do that, define what is the entropy solution backwards in time, right? You are also defining a unique semigroup. So out of this PDE, you have two semigroup, S plus and S minus. S plus is entropy solution in the forward sense, and S minus is the entropy solution in the backward sense. So when you do approximation through either entropy or good numerics to this PDE, basically what you are doing through inverse design is adopting the backward semigroup, which is entropic. And then what you are doing is out of the final datum, you are taking the entropic solution of burgers, and therefore you are getting always to this initial datum. So actually, you know, the solution we get numerically is always close to this. Why? Because my claim is indeed. There are infinitely many solutions, initial data, that lead to the same target. But if you ask me, which is the initial datum that you get by backwards entropic resolution of burgers is this one. Because when you solve backwards burgers from this target towards the initial datum, you observe that for the backwards burgers, the role of admissible and, in, and inadmissible shocks changes, this shock is inadmissible and therefore it becomes a rarefaction. And this ramp here has the tendency to generate a shock. So conclusion, what is more the most likely computational solution is the backward entropic solution and this is what we are saying. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. So, sir, you have talked about some uh, example given by the Serene in L infinity space. Right. Yeah. So, can you just uh, put some light on that? Uh, like, what was that? Yeah. So, maybe maybe someone. Uh, so, do you know this, Shirshendu, or someone in the lecture room has? Uh, uh, let me see if. Um, uh, okay. So. So maybe I should open the browser with you and then, um, okay, share the browser. Okay, so you see my web page here. I mean, the, the Google Scholar, we open Google Scholar. Okay, you see it? You see it, right? Yes. Sir. Okay, so I open and then I write a certain, uh 
counter example do do i will i get this no so this is about uh, yeah he has several examples So it could be here. I don't know this paper. Huh? This is the first time I am open it, but it's about this, right? So the question is whether there is a nice paper by Brazil on this actually, where I mean the topic is still ongoing, right? So the topic that Brazil has considered is what is the minimal regularity you have imposed, you have to impose, so to guarantee that the solution is the zero one, right? And then, so here you go, right? So probably we go here. We can discuss that maybe tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Pathological solutions of elliptic differential equations, analytic PISA 64, so 60 years ago. Okay? okay? So have a look and we can talk about this tomorrow. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. See you then tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.